through their actions. We pray for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd now like to hand over to Josh as he brings us the Bible reading. Yep, I'm Josh. I'm going to read you the Bible. Um, We're going to be reading 1 Kings 17, and on the Pew Bibles in front of you, it's on page 352. The title is, Elijah Announces a Great Drought. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the (laughs) Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath, Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah." Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Please come up, John. John's going to give the sermon today. So let's pray for him. Dear Lord, please be with John right now as he gives this sermon. Please help him to have the right words to say and please help him to speak from your heart and not his own. Help us to listen to what he has to say and and understand what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The first thing I'd like to do 
Can you hear me? First thing I'd like to do is to ask our new administrator to stand up. Would you stand up if you're here, please, our new administrator? Is he here? He's not here. <laughs> That's strange. You know, the best thing about that man, the best thing about that man is his last name. <laughs> right? He is without sin. <laughs> Remember? Remember? Yes. That fell flat, didn't it? I mean, it was, that was supposed to be really good. Oh dear, never mind. Over the last few weeks we've been talking about this notion not only of who our God is, and we've discovered a little bit about uh, the majesty of, of his greatness, but what we've been wanting to talk about... Sorry, ladies, when I was teaching at college this was known as the spray zone. <laughs> so, so I hope you're OK. Um, where was I? So now, now we're talking about the issues of doing. How do we do? If this God is who he says he is, and if he calls us into his presence and asks us to be his people, how do we do? What do we do? We've talked about prayer and the things we can do in our relationship with God. We've talked about the Bible, reading the Bible. We've talked about spending time alone with God. Now, I want to talk about something else which in the first place, in the first instance, sounds contradictory. You would say obedience is not one of the gifts of God to us because obedience denies us the right to develop our own lives in the direction we want them to go, we would think. But I want to say to you that that's not the case at all. In fact, we will discover that obedience is one of God's greatest gifts to us forever. Let me just uh, begin by saying here, look, uh, um, there are hallmarks about each one of us. Each one of us has characteristics which identify our authenticity. If I were to go to the police station and give them my finger fingerprints, they would be able to identify my past, if there has been. There hasn't, fortunately. But they would be able to identify it by my fingerprints. Uh, they would be able to identify by my modus operandi the kinds of things that I do and the way I do them and they would be able to identify me and they would be able to say, that's that person there. My DNA can't be changed. It is what it is. And that's who I am. And they can identify mothers and fathers from the DNA that they give to the uh, scientists to tell whether they're really mothers and fathers of children. We can be told by these signs and these characteristics. Signature tunes is another one. Uh, but uh, we need to understand that fingerprints, whilst they're unique to each of us, teach the world the uniqueness behind who we are. They identify our character, our personality. And the ownership of our reputation, our character, is shown in our fingerprints. Human beings are not the only ones with fingerprints, though. God has fingerprints, and whilst we can't see them externally... We can recognise his fingerprints from the things he does and from the ways he does them. And the, the most useful thing we can do is to learn to recognise finger, God's fingerprints in our lives. To be able to see that in the events of our lives, we see not just the event itself, not the issue that we're facing, but the fingerprint of the living God guiding us and keeping us through those events. The more we can learn about those, the more likely we are to be able to possess that in the future, when things are not exactly as they are now. This is what happens, really, I think. I, this is my picture of it, anyway. Sensing destiny in our experience of God's fingerprints, prince, this is the kind of stuff that happens to us. First of all, God initiates. God starts. He enters into our life. He breaks into the reality of who we are and touches our nervous spirit touches our nerves and says to us, come on, there's the potential here for you to be something other than you are. Let me point out to you what you might be. Let me identify for you the things that you're able to do. And so we sense his awesomeness in that. We get a sense of, here is one beyond me. Here is one outside of me. Here is one who is going to be able to bring to me something that I am not yet, but that I might become. And the things that I can do into the future are not linked to who I am, but are linked to this relationship with the living God. 
and we begin in our spirits and our stomachs begin to churn and our hearts begin to thump a little bit, begin to perspire and we begin to say, Lord, you're now taking me to places I don't know about. Our perspectives change and we see things according to God. And all of a sudden the things that were impossible are there for God to do, God type things. And suddenly there's a possibility for the God type things to be a part of our life. Old ideas and values are changed forever. We leave them behind as the building blocks of our lives get resorted. As the new values begin to take place in our lives and begin to transform us in all sorts of different ways. Our lives change and often dramatically. We find ourselves leaving university courses thinking we were going to be the best accountant on the face of the earth and we wind up going to somewhere overseas serving in a mission organisation. Right? That's the sort of stuff that happens. We are released into his calling and we begin to discover the courage of the committed. We begin to discover that when God says to us, when God places his finger on us, when God identifies us for a task, there is nothing that will stop us from that task. Because we have heard not just the call, but we have sensed the character behind the call. The call says to us, be my girl, be my boy. Be my child and let's w move together, let's work together. Now, I, I asked uh, for us to read the story about Elijah because in Elijah's life we see incredibly clear pictures of God's action in, 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 action in, in Elijah's life. There's a crystal clear picture of the process of God's fingerprints in action. The first fingerprint is this. God deals with human beings who are serious about their relationship with him always on the basis of obedience. Always on the basis of obedience. He says, we do. He speaks, we listen. He says, we obey. And one of the characteristics that we will find out about Elijah is that he's taken on a journey of obedience to learn the things that he needs to have in place so that when God calls from him the ultimate event of his life, he is going to be in a position to be able to respond to God in ways that are perfectly correct. It happens all over the place, of course. John chapter 15, 1 to 10, you're, I'm, the, I'm the vine, you are the, uh, you are the, the, the attachments, you, you must bear much fruit, apart from me, you can do nothing, etc., Anybody who know that one will know that one better than me. Jesus in Hebrew 5.8, Moses, David, Paul, all of these have begun to understand that in Jesus, uh, in God's command for us, the ultimate reality is obedience. Why obedience? Because we human beings have the worst record in the world for perverting what God is doing to our own ends. We say... These trees are ours. He says those trees are mine and you're here to look after them. We say those trees are mine and I can cut them down. He says here is a world with all sorts of minerals around the place. You can be careful and use them. We say no, well, let's dig a great big hole and expose to the atmosphere all of the gathering up of the, the carbon for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, he says this is, this, is my, this is my ocean, keep it clean. And we say no, that's where we'll dump our rubbish. Let's get this clear. We are the worst people on the face of the earth to pervert what God is doing for our own ends. That's not a criticism, it's a statement. And I'm not necessarily pointing the finger at any one of you or me. But that's what humanity is doing. And, and, and we need to understand that in this, in this particular position, we need to listen to God's first fingerprint. Watch Elijah and the integrity checks that he has along the way. God is testing him after having told him. Elijah, this is what I want you to do. First of all, I want you to come and be my prophet and I want you to speak to the king and I want you to tell the king that because of his wickedness and particularly because of the naughtiness of his, his dreadful wife, there will be no rain for three years or more 
until he says so. Now, would you be prepared to go and see King Charles III and say, Charlie, by the way, there'll be no rain for the next three years because you've been a naughty boy. Not too many should get past the front door. He does. And God says to him, now, uh, there are problems with this, my friend. You're going to have to disappear for a while, go and stay by the brook in Kareth Ravine. And while you're there, talk to me. Now, we've got to remember, and this is really important, we've got to remember that Elijah had no idea what was to come. We know the story. Elijah doesn't know the story. All he knows is that he's told everybody there's going to be no rain and in this, in this whole environment, in the, mo the most stupid thing to do is to go and sit by a ravine where you know full well that the brook is going to dry out. God says, are you listening, Elijah? What I want you to do is to go into Kerith Ravine and I want you to be obedient. I'm going to test you, Elijah, because I want you to see, I already know what character formation there is in you, but I want you to see it. I want you to see what you need to learn to be, my, to be my servant. Elijah, what I'd like you to do is to go and ask the widow for some food. There's no food. Nobody's got food. Why would he ask the woman for food? Elijah, are you going to do as, I'm, as I tell you to do? And are you going to discover that along the way, as I tell you what to do, I'll find you the next place to go, the next thing to do, the next thing to say and I will organise your life and I will care for you in the process. I want you to understand that Elijah. I want you to be prepared to say yes no matter what I say to you. Elijah, the child's died. Would you please take the child up into the upper room where there's silence and there's due and he and would you follow the normal pattern, lying on top of him, breathing into him, etc. And would you raise him from the dead? Now, I, if, I were me, if it were me, I'm sure I would be scared witless. How can God expect another human being to raise another from the dead? Elijah discovers that when God says, and he does, God acts. When God says... And he does, God acts. It's all about obedience. It's completely about obedience. Raise the child, of course the child was raised from the dead. Then he has to go out and meet a Obadiah, who's the big servant who's been sent out to try and find him, to bring him back to Ahab so that he might crucify him, or at least kill him. And then uh, after that, uh, he's got to say, what in the world is going on? What's happening to me here? And the answer is Mount Carmel. He hasn't got a clue what Mount Carmel means. What it means is this. The reason the Israelites are in trouble is because the king has allowed the prophets of Baal to run the country. And he says, I will share my glory with no one. And if the prophets of Baal are going to behave the way they are and Jezebel is going to put them into places they shouldn't be, then I will say to you, I will take away the very thing you need and Elijah, one day into the future, I'm going to say to you, call the prophets of Baal, every one of them, get them out and give them a challenge, which is to, to slaughter an animal, put it on a pile and call down fire from heaven. And the God who answers will be the God who really is God. No challenge. No, this is not a battle at all. So the prophets and priests of Baal cut themselves and, and carry on and all that sort of stuff and there's nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. Elijah says, slaughter the animal, get some buckets of water, pour them around the altar, and again, another one, no, yep, another more, pour, pour it on. And then he lifts up his hands on the basis of the last three years of, uh, of, his, in, of his involvement with the living God. He says, Lord God, will you come down with fire and will you consume this animal and down it comes now Elijah has learned that this God when he speaks is able and prepared to do all he needs to do is to be obedient all he needs to do is respond 
with truth and reality in his spirit and God is reliable, he is trustworthy and he will do. How have you responded to the integrity checks in your life? Have you seen them as the basic things of your life? Are they the purpose for your existence? I want to say to you, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the events that you're facing at this moment are not the reality that is the purpose of your existence. Talk about that in a minute. Fingerprint two, the Desert Bible Institute. Now, Elijah's been sent by the river for three years, or living with the widow. Uh, that, that period is three years' time. Can you, can you imagine yourself? You're Elijah. You hear God say to you now, go and sit by the ravine. <clears throat> okay. A week later, you say, well, I'm, I'm here, Lord. What, what do you want? How, how long is this going to go for? Uh, Elijah, just sit and listen to me. Six months later, remember, Elijah has no idea of the future. God is saying, stay with me. Two years later, Elijah is still in the ravine. God's time is best. He will take the time that he needs. He will do whatever he chooses to do with you and with Elijah. And his time is best. Not your time, not mine. Well, let's have a look at this. It's a common process of God to take those for whom he has tasks through desert experiences. Every, let me just point out, of course, that you know I'm not talking about you being Elijah. I'm not talking about you having to have the same experiences as Elijah. Every one of us has experiences that are related to our own personality. Everyone has experiences with God that relate to our own character, with our own purpose, with God's intention for our lives. And for every single one of us, that's vastly different. I'm simply trying to use Elijah as a classic example of what God does. He will do different things with you, but expect it. What has been the Desert Bible Institute for you? Taking you out into the desert of life and saying, sit with me. Cope with this stuff. Let me be with you for three years. These days we'd have people off to psychiatrists and psychologists and all the rest of it and saying, I can't cope with this anymore. We've coped with two and a half years of COVID virus and we all think we're the end of our lives. God's time is best. He knows what he's doing. Paul, Moses, Peter, average people, Elijah all go through this process of the Desert Bible Institute. All of us go through that place where we discover who God is for our circumstance, for our character. He takes us. And you know, one of the things that happens to us as he brings to us uh, integrity checks along the way, if we fail an, elect, uh, an integrity check, do you know what he does? Takes us back again and takes us through the integrity check until we pass the integrity check and we can move on to the next one. Maybe that's why it took three years for Elijah. Why? Why the Desert Bible Institute? Well, to learn lessons specific to the task. I don't know what your task is. I know what mine is. I know what Elijah's task was. What's yours? What's he doing in you that gives you the possibility of sensing who he is and in the doing of the faith what is he putting in place in your life, in your character, in the formation of your personality? What's he putting there that makes it possible for you to do for him? None of this is theoretical. I'm not embarking upon, upon some deep theological exegesis of Elijah. I'm simply saying, watch what God is doing. A lesson to learn lessons specific to the task for Elijah, it was faith. Spiritual authority, supernatural power. I mean, Elijah stood up against the prophets of Baal and he was able to say to them, do as you are told. Because God had done something in his life to give him the spiritual authority to stand firm as God's prophet. Then he knew how to deal with the spiritual, supernatural world, the clash of the kingdoms, and he was able to, he was able to kill 200 prophets of Baal at the, at the creek after the event. 
He learnt that because that was what he was supposed to be doing. Sometimes it's to develop an intimacy with God that will sustain them through the spiritual warfare involved. Where do you go? Where is the secret place? Where do you go to find the living God again? Where have you sat and listened to him? What have you done to allow his music to play into your life? Where do you go when things are not going well? Sometimes to focus their attention, their attitudes, their divine destiny onto that task. I started life as a teacher and I had every plan to be a principal of a high school uh, and I was well on the way to that. I was been teaching for 12 years and I was about to be a deputy principal of a high school in Adelaide. And one moment in a church setting, he said to me, listen to this guy, because what he's talking about is where I want you to go. All values change. And I've done as he told me to do. In my own little way, I've had my task. I see myself entirely as a servant of the living God. That's what I do. Whatever he says I do, he's the boss. And he's done things in me that's made it possible for me to have a ministry. What's he doing in you? Not easy questions to answer. Elijah experiences the circumstances common to all and he discovers who God is in them. Look at that sentence. He discovers who God is in them. The events of our lives are never the purpose of our lives. The events of our lives are the circumstance in which we discover who God is. We think the circumstance of a moment is all that there is. He says, no, 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 I've got you here for three years. Uh, a, little bit, a little bit later you're going to be uh, calling down fire from heaven. Don't worry about the event now. I'm preparing you, I'm setting you up. Now, a, a classic statement that you need, to, you need to really understand. God, Don't be afraid of God's DBI in your own life, Desert Bible Institute, but beware. God's desert experiences nurture us, but desert experiences of our own making may kill us. Don't manufacture things for God. Don't say to yourself, I'll deliberately go out on a limb here and see what he has to say. Unless he tells you to go out on the limb, you do not do that. God's integrity is absolutely critical to you being who you are. Fingerprint three. There are two more, so if you're thinking there's only three points in the sermon, you've got it wrong. There's another one after this one. The main thing. This is the third point. It's easy to be consumed by the present event. That's what I've just been talking about. It's easy to say, this event is all there is in my life. This, is the, this event is what I need to struggle with. This, is, this event is all there is, and I'm heading for this event. The critical issue, you see, is not the event. The critical issue has never been the event. The critical issue, however, is, well, in the, each of the events of our lives, carry with them the potential for subversion from the real thing. We get, our so, get ourselves so tied up with the notion, I've got to achieve here, or I've got to do this here, I've got to earn that reputation here, I've got to have a lot of money to do this. And we get subverted into the things of this world and we find out all of a sudden we're miles away from where the boss wants us to be. The main thing is to know Jesus. The main thing is to know Jesus. To share his heartbeat, to develop a powerful relationship, to play our lives to him as our only audience. The events of today are not significant themselves. They are simply the location of our discovering who God is. They are the place where in playing out our faith, we discover who he is and what he does. We begin to sense the noise of the spirit in our lives and we sense, begin to sense how to respond because life in the kingdom of God is always of the Spirit. You see the last statement there? To play our lives to him as our only audience. 
There are many of us who play our lives to all sorts of audiences. Some of us play our lives to impress our parents. We go and do study that our parents want us to do. Some of, our, some of us live our lives to impress a girl. Or we spend our lives to impress a boy. Or at work we try and be the best that we can be to impress the boss. And you can go on. There are that many things in our world that subvert us. We play our lives as the people of Jesus. We play our lives to Jesus Christ as the only audience in our life. What he says matters. When he says, well done, my little girl. Well done, my boy. We're on track. It does not matter what anybody else thinks. The main thing is to ensure that the main thing remains the main thing. Right? The main thing is to ensure that the main thing remains the main thing. Whatever happens to me, I keep my focus on Jesus. Whatever happens to me, whatever the circumstances are, I still seek to play my life to Jesus Christ. Whatever comes and goes, whatever battles I fight, whatever people say to me, whatever people do to me, they are simply the events of my life. They are not the purpose of my life. The purpose of my life is to please Jesus, is to be Jesus' person. Fingerprint four. The battle belongs to the Lord. Elijah may well have said on Mount, uh, whatever it was, forget it. Sorry? Thank you very much, Mount Carmel. Elijah might well have said, now I, I've been here before, I can do this. I can take on these prophets of Baal. What I'll do is to round up the troops who've never said a word in support of me or God for years, round them up and conduct some kind of a campaign and slaughter the prophets of Baal. I can do that. In which case he would have been thoroughly defeated and God's name would have been shamed. What he does though is to listen to what God says. And God instructs him, now pour water on the animal. Now step away. Now challenge the prophets of Baal. See what they do. Give them plenty of time to make fools of themselves. Now do something totally unheard of and call down fire from heaven. Elijah the priests of Baal and the great contest was the battle belongs to the Lord. What's looming for you as battles? You are not on your own. Your capacity to act is based on who your God is. If your God is food, well then all the best. If your God is money, tough luck. Because money will take you nowhere. This is the task where Elijah puts into effect all he's learned about who God is, familiarity with God's voice and his commands, his perception of who God is and what he says and what he does. And now we come to the conclusion and say, these fingerprints are all wrapped together and are dimensions of the notion of obedience. These are the processes through which obedience happens. The location where we're able to say, I need to act with integrity in relation to my master. I'm speaking, he's the audience whom I serve. Here, here in these circumstances is, is what I need to do. All of these fingerprints are dimensions of the obedience which God demands, accepts, expects in the formation of his disciples. Every one of us is different. Every one of us will run a different race, every different course. But the process will be the same. Responding in obedience each time. Our own Desert Bible Institute. Our own little race to be run. The main thing. You're keeping the main thing the main thing at the moment, team? Or is uh, the examination too looming? Or is that final essay? too hard 
The battle belongs to the Lord. It's not about you at all. It's not about us. Back one. The opportunity he gives for obedience from us involves us in the actions of God on earth. This is why I say to you that this gift of God is a gift of gold. Because he says to you, now if you're prepared to be obedient to me, if you're prepared to do what I tell you to do, I will flow through you my action into the world for the sake of the world. I will form you to be like Jesus, but I will allow you to watch me use you to achieve the things of the kingdom in this world. Now, I don't know about you, but I reckon that's about the most wonderful thing you could ever expect to happen. I watch God use me. (laughs) When he says, I want you to give $500 to this thing over here, and I say, okay. And I watch the money go in, and I see the person over there who, who we gave it to just thoroughly excited because God's provided. I say, thank you, God. Thank you. You gave me the resources, and I managed them as you told me to. That's what they were for. You see, obedience is not a bad thing. Obedience is a wonderful thing. Each experience of personal formation through obedience is the step in the maturity of our lives to be like Jesus. Each experience, each event is a part of the building block changes bit by bit in our character. Come on, Gertie. Can you help me up there? There we go. Intimacy. Oh, now we've got them all. Intimacy flows through every day, every action of obedience. When I step into a relationship with the living God and I relate to him and I do what he tells me to do, I find he's standing right there with me. When I, when I listen, when you listen to what he's saying and you discover that he's right behind you and you're like that, Little experiences, one after the other, do this. Till you live in love with Jesus. Till you live in obedience with Jesus that takes you on. This is the doing of our faith. This is the doing of our faith. Next one. Obedience has nothing to do with diminishment of who we are. Rather, everything to do with expanding the horizons of who we might become. Obedience does not say, I'll have to leave something of my desire behind. It says, submit your desires to the master and he will show you what those might become with his power. And he will take you to a place that you have never, ever dreamed of. And you'll discover that one of the greatest things in your life you long for is his word and your ability to be obedient to it. Finally, we'll do the next one. The opportunity for obedience is one of God's greatest gifts for us. Let's come to the communion table. Uh, the reason I say that, you see, is because this table itself, too, is a step of obedience. He says to us, come, sit at this table and observe me. Observe what I've done. I myself have been obedient to my Father, and I show you my arms and my hands and my feet and my side, and I show you my blood, And I say to you, this is what I think obedience means. And he says to us, join me in obedience. Watch me, listen to me, hear me, and do as I have done. So at this table tonight, I invite you to be obedient. Here it's not just walking forward and taking the elements, which we'll do in a moment. Here... It's in your character saying, yes, obedience to you is where I live. I am a servant of the living God and I live in you. So this just becomes another of the acts of obedience which speak to us of the greatness of God.
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even this is an act of obedience to show the world who he is. Life is about obedience. Jesus took the bread and as his disciples were watching, he said, this is my body which is for you. Scared out of their wits, they took it. What does he mean? We know. Passed it round. I, uh, I have... I have something to drink in there, the stuff that we normally drink. And I'm going to say to you that out of this here, that's from me, it's my blood. And I'm going to sign a document for the universe to note. And that is my document of covenant with my children. With you guys, with me. It's a document of covenant. And he says to us, because we are so bad at keeping covenants... He says to us, come to me. And every time you do this, redo the covenant with me. Deal with the issues that are in your life. Come and sign again. So I want to invite you, as I did last time, to spend the time of disobedience. There'll be people who will be out here to give you the elements. Saying to the Lord, Lord, look into who I am. Speak to me about my understanding of obedience and help me grow. This is one of the golden gifts Jesus has for us. And here we share it together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you have done. You're not only demonstrated in these elements, but in your body and in your blood, you have done what you call upon us to do. And we come now as your servants, knowing full well that we don't measure up completely to what you want us to be, knowing that we need your forgiveness, your healing, before we are in the position to spiritually relate to you, but wanting at the same time to take the truth of your invitation of love, your invitation of forgiveness, your invitation of healing, of grace, of mercy. We want to take that written down in your blood and make it our own. Lord, as we come to you, we bless you, we praise you, we honour you, and we share in the meal you have provided for us. Amen. Those who are helping us here like to come forward. Simply access the resources that are provided, the blood and, the, uh, and the, the body of Christ. And go back to your seat. Take the elements with you and we'll share when everybody's been served.